this time uh, discussing the other uh, significant uh, anniversary uh, that's taking place this year, namely the, the uh, 25th anniversary of the 1986 Tax Reform Act with uh, major participants in it, um, including John Mueller, who is back with us because he was uh, on Jack Hemp's staff throughout uh, the period, Dave Hoppe, who was his chief of staff at the time, uh, Jeff Bell, who was always around, as, as we discussed in the 78 campaign, and then w Bill Bradley reveals that, that uh, he was instrumental in advising him and cheering him with him and drinking champagne with him uh, when, when, the, when the battle was done. Senator uh, uh, Robert Caston of uh, Wisconsin, who was um, a co-sponsor of the uh, Kemp Caston bill, which uh, the Republican version of uh, tax reform, and as we said, Alan Murray, who was the other author of the book on the uh, on the subject. Uh, still, still for sale. Still, still, on still it's on okay. Okay. Um, so we had uh, we had Art Laffer as the um, as the introduction to the first panel. And now we have a laugher of a different kind to introduce this panel. Go ahead and play that. This is an it's audio. We'll sing about the greatest thing to ever hit this city. The latest plan for tax reform to come out of committee. Now every lobby has a pack. Each senator a kitty. Perhaps you'd like to leave right now. The story isn't pretty. Reagan pack would Austin Kowski tax simplification. Nothing's getting simplified, it's just a complication. We worked on it long enough, it's time for our vacation. Reagan pack would Austin Kowski tax simplification. I'm the little, little, I'm the lie, I'm the little, little, I'm the lie. It started with a Reagan plan to make your taxes leaner. Then Rossi got a hold of it, but didn't make it cleaner. Then over on the Senate floor, it changed its whole demeanor. Don't watch him write a tax bill and don't watch him make a wee. The Reagan back with the Rustin Kowski tax simplification. In committee, every member had an alteration. The lawyers will make millions off of this new legislation. The Reagan back with the Rustin Kowski tax simplification. I'm the little, little, I'm the lie. I'm the little, little, I'm the lie. The plan aroused Bob Packwood from a three term Senate slumber. Each time he hit the bottom line, he'd get a different number. Your big campaign contributors, they'll not let you encumber. The taxes on our eye. But not on fish and lumber. Under the little, little under lie, under the little, little under lie. The plan was getting longer when it should have gotten shorter. Now Packwood has a plan to end this tax reform disorder. He says just run the tax code backwards in a tape recorder. The letters are the same, you see, just in the other order. Noi tack if lip miss attic swat net or do cap nager. They say they'll take the loopholes out. But in the end they'll stay there. They all behave in Congress like the children do in daycare. We re-elect them anyway, so what the hell do they care? No, they can pack with Ross and Cast or Tax or Duke Cap Nager. They say they'll take the loopholes out of the end. They all they on the side of the they all will make a race. It's a super fragile, unsimplistic tax complication. Steps. So, um, panel. What? So, what are the origins of Jack Kemp's um, interest in tax reform? Where did where did that idea come from? Well, I know that in 1982, uh, he and uh, Bill Broad had uh, talked about a, a tax reform, co-sponsoring a tax reform. Who was reform a plan. Democratic congressman from, uh, or was it uh, Michigan? Michigan? Yeah. And uh, it would have been a, um, a, a rate-reducing, base-driving bill. It never really uh, went anywhere, though they did discuss it seriously. Um, I think uh, I should start by saying that um, Tax reform uh, stressed all the fault lines of both parties, but also stressed the fault lines in the uh, in the supply side movement, precisely because of the uh, difference in emphasis as to whether it's um, um, things like the investment tax credit or the rate reduction, which uh, have m the most oomph. And uh, so he would not have the uh, unified party behind him that he uh, did in the beginning. Uh, as um, 
your conversation with uh, Senator Bradley uh, mentioned, we did have a, um, a poolside party in Jack's backyard in uh, August of 83, uh, at which um, Irving Crystal made the suggestion that the Republicans should just endorse Bradley Gephardt. And that we had a, the kind of man bites dog uh, approach to it that, that he liked. And uh, we did seriously discuss whether that was, uh, that would be a good idea. Uh, among the folks who were there were uh, well, Alan Reynolds, uh, Craig Roberts, Richard Ron, uh, then at the U.S. Chamber, Jeff Bell, Irving Crystal, Jude Winiski, Mark Miles, um, Lou Lehrman, and uh, Norman Touré. And uh, we discussed seriously uh, as darkness fell whether we should uh, just go with uh, Irving Crystal's idea. But as uh, is mentioned in uh, Showdown at Gucci Gulch, Lou Lehrman's uh, point carried the day, which was that uh, he thought we could do better and that it would be better politically for the Republicans to have their own uh, version of tax reform because it was uh, it would, uh, we could lead to a better ultimate result. So there were two uh, principles that Bradley had laid down when he did his bill in 1982, uh, two principles of tax reform. One was that it should not raise or lose revenue. It should be revenue neutral. And the other was that it should not change the distribution of the tax code. It should be distributionally ne neutral. Now, you can argue over whether his bill was or wasn't, but those were the principles. Was this group? sitting uh, in around Jack Kemp's pool in August of 1983 in agreement with those principles? Uh, most, most of them actually had, did not have a firm uh, view on the issue. It was my job as uh, Jack's liaison to the supply siders to poll everybody, uh, which I did in the, in the next month. Um, uh, I polled them about their analyses of this specific bill, whether it would fly or not. And uh, we came to the conclusion after about a month's discussion that we could, we could do a lot better. Uh, Bradley Gephardt did get the rates down, um, but it also repealed indexing, which is a big deal when there uh, was still inflation. Uh, it um, reduced, the, the, got much of its revenue by disallowing the deductions for everything above the 14% uh, rate. And it's, uh, there really wasn't a, a firm reason for doing that, so you, you had uh, what we thought w was differential tre treatment of uh, different tra taxpayers. But, uh, but they, they argue the reason to, for doing that was the, this distributional neutrality idea. When you bring down the top tax rate as much as they were bringing it down, it, it looked like you were giving a big tax cut to the people at the top, and so they made that up by taking away all those popular deductions from people at the top. Right, and w but we thought we could, we could build a better mousetrap because uh, um, uh, the the so-called flat tax was uh, very salient at that time, and I think Pete Dupont was actually running on a version of the Hall Rabushka plan, and that was one of, one of the first um, plans. Even George Shultz had mentioned it uh, in the uh, context of tax reform to the president, and so it was out there. And it was uh, apart from Bradley Gephardt, the first tax plan that I analyzed. And the difficulty with uh, this approach is not the flatness of the rate, but what you might call the lumpiness of the base because um, the current income tax system uh, then as now is based on all income, labor plus property income. But the so-called consumption tax um, defines investment as investment only in property, in things, but not investment in so-called human capital. And so there was this disparity built uh, into it at the time so that if you um, zero out the taxes on the investment in property through expensing of the initial investment, but also zero out the rate of return on that investment in terms of no tax on capital gains, uh, interest, and dividends. You've taken all the property income out of the tax, tax base, and that not only shrinks it the, by about one third, requiring a top rate 50% higher, but it also is also very lumpy because uh, most 80% of American families get about 80% of their income from labor income. And uh, th this is the, uh, the point of the, uh, this two-page, uh, on one side of this two-page chart, chart uh, uh, I handed out where it says the most common and durable source of factions, uh, quoting James Madison, where he said is the various and unequal distribution of property. This explains, this chart explains to me why 
uh, the Reagan-Kemp approach was popular, treating everybody the same, cutting rates across the board on both labor and property income, because it shows that the uh, U.S. voter self-identification tracks very closely with the uh, level and shares of income coming from labor and property income. The uh, Democrats are very uh, strong at the lowest levels of income, but it tapers off toward the, toward the top because as you go up the income scale, you get more and more of your income from, from property income. And so there's a reason why the, the Democrats are always trying to uh, load all the taxes onto property income because these are not their constituents and to lower the taxes on, as far as possible on labor income. And conversely, the uh, Republicans are always trying to uh, zero out the taxes if possible on property income and load all the taxes on labor income. Uh, that's, both are politically unpopular, but the Democrat uh, strategy is less unpopular because about 50% uh, of voters identify themselves as uh, Democrats, about 40% of Republicans and 10% as independents. And so to get more than 50%, if you're uh, a, a president like Reagan, you've got to get all the Republicans, all the independents, and some what, what used to be called Reagan Democrats. And the way to do that, th this made this politically successful, is to get all the rates down and broaden the base uh, as far as possible to spread the, um, uh, the taxes as broadly as possible. That's why I think both Camp Roth and the 86 tax reform worked politically and why more recent efforts on both sides have not worked because the parties are still focusing on uh, the interests of their constituents but not seeing the big picture. Well, I think you're right. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the answer to your question was that most Republicans hope to lower rates at that, at that point. I mean, that was the hope. And, and I think that the kind of the, the background, including the flat tax debate, is an important part of the, of the foundations, if you will, of, of, what, we, of what we did. And, and people were concerned because of the politics of it. I mean, not just the real estate lobby, but there were a number of different people that were. So we started talking to people about flat tax, and then later about, about the other, the 86 tax reform, people were concerned not about the economics, but were concerned about the politics. Hmm. And, and uh, the politics started to work its way through when it was recognized that Bradley Gebhardt would stay with us and we had the support of the president, and we had the support of the Treasury Secretary, as Bill Bradley's uh, tape just, go, just showed. Just to go back to this 83, uh, August 83 poolside meeting, uh, was the purpose of, the, was the gathering uh, assembled I to deal with Bradley Gephardt, or was it for some other reason? It was to figure out what the next step was. Uh, Jack was already talking. Um, as early as uh, early 83 about the next step in Reaganomics. Um, there was a, uh, an effort each year after Kemp Roth to have a tax increase of, of some sort. Uh, TEPRA, there was an 83 bill, uh, 84. And the idea, I think, on the supply side's part was to have a, a counter move to get the rates down with a base broadening approach and to head off tax increases, which would otherwise be uh, inevitable. And so the idea that uh, I think was in general agreement it was that Jack should wildcat with uh, dissident uh, Democrats like uh, uh, Bill Bradley. And as Bradley mentioned, uh, he, it seemed to be a live option that he would be able to sell uh, the Democrats on the idea for the 1984 campaign. And therefore, the Republicans should have their own version uh, of it. And, and so that was, it was what's the next step? And uh, it was so debating. So did, did Jack Kemp just did, did he direct the discussion? Did he did he uh, did did he just listen as everybody else? I'm, I'm just trying to get a, a picture of what what exactly what happened around role? the pool yeah. side. Yeah. No. yeah. What I mean, you have these two competing factions. Irving Crystal says endorse uh, Bradley Gephardt. Others say, well, no, we don't like Bradley Gephardt. You need to do your own bill. What, what, how did Jack? It was a more free willing discussion because um, many of the participants. Uh, stipulated they did not have intimate knowledge of what was actually in Bradley Gephardt, <laughs> and that's why it took a, a month of uh, <laughs> further polling and, and reconsideration to... So if I could say my memory of, of the conversation is that when Irving said that, there was a stunned silence <laughs> around the pool. Nobody had a ready-made objection to it, and that moment, the lack of objection, the stunned silence, had enormous weight 
in what John subsequently described as carrying out the, uh, the logistics of the, of the opinion, the survey, so to speak. Oh, you were there? Yeah, yes. I, I must say I don't remember the details of it too much, but I know my basic objection is very similar to my objection to what was done in October 1990 by the elder President Bush, which is that if you keep the rate down but phase out deductions and exemptions, you're raising the marginal rate. In the case of the Bush, it's about four and a half points. By the way, President Obama wants to do that, so that's four and a half points added to 39.6 plus the Medicare taxes, 2.9. Top rate would go to 47 percent plus state taxes. We already have, according to the OECD, the most progressive tax system among, among the major industrial countries. Not so much because of high rates at the top, but because of negative income taxes, the earned income tax credit and child credit in the bottom fifth, bottom 30 percent, really. Also, because of the earlier tax rate reductions, every time we cut the rates, the distribution of the tax burden has skewed upwards. Has skewed upwards, downward. absolutely right. Uh, and we used that in uh, in articles at the time, it, both in predicting the, the uh, results and then in in uh, trumpeting the results when they actually came in. So, so afterwards, you you did a poll of all these people. How did the poll come out? Um, mixed. <laughs> uh, it was really. Um, Jack's accepting um, Lou Lehrman's um, argument that it was better to have a Republican alternative as a counterweight uh, rather than putting all the eggs in one basket, that we could do more by going on separate tracks in our parties because there are lots of dynamics within each party. Uh, and Jack was at his best uh, in open field running politically. That's why he, he thrived in the House. That's where everybody has his own Secretary of State and his own uh, Secretary of De Defense. and. Uh, he, he just excelled in that kind of uh, changing environment. And uh, so, how much of this? How much of this was politics? That is, the, the, the Republicans had to have their own plan because it, they had to have a plan that was different from the Democratic plan. And also, to what extent was Jack thinking about running for president in 1988 and wanted a, another signature program to run on? I, th I think it was certainly on his mind, uh, but the, he, the uh, presidential stuff didn't really gear, gear up until 85, 86. So this poolside meeting, which was a, a few years before that, I think primarily he wanted to head off tax increases immediately. Uh, and Because uh, you, you, you folks were uh, at the time a little discouraged, right? I mean, you had a big tax increase in 82. You were looking at tax increases in 83. It must have felt in August of 83 that the momentum had shifted. Yeah, it was absolutely an attempt at a counterattack on the tax increases. I mean, that was, I can just speak for myself being there. That's what I wanted to have come out of it, because I believed ideologically in lower tax rates being a better system. And, uh, but the politics of it at that particular moment were not favorable to that point of view. And recall also that the, the increased tax rates were primarily uh, on the corporate side, we're talking about stretching out what had been accelerated depreciation and that sort of thing. Um, and that gets back to that tension between the corporatist type supply siders and those who are focusing on individual rates. They hadn't messed with individual rates at this point. Bruce, did you want to? Yeah, I, I think that the history is getting a little bit skewed here. The, uh, the most important thing driving tax reform, in, in my opinion, was that, that right after the tax cut of 81 took place, the deficit suddenly became a big issue. And so that just took tax cuts off the table, right? And so the uh, so it was in December of 81 uh, that Hollander Bushka wrote their famous uh, Wall Street Journal article laying out the idea of the flat tax. And very shortly thereafter, there was a very influential article by an economist friend of ours named uh, David Hale that appeared in the Heritage Foundation's uh, journal in which he made an interesting argument, which was if we do revenue neutral tax reform on a static basis, on a dynamic basis, it will raise revenue. And so this became a very popular way to talk about tax raising revenues in a supply side context. And if you check the historical record, you'll see that by mid-1982, there was already a very considerable amount of discussion about some doing tax reform and having some sort of flat tax. Uh, David Stockman was talking about maybe putting it into the budget for January. Ronald Reagan uh, made a public statement about this at a, 
in a speech in California in July. Uh, the, uh, the Joint Economic Committee held hearings on the flat tax in 82, and so did the Senate Finance Committee. So all this, you know, well predates Kemp Casting. And so the ground was being plowed by ideas such as the flat tax that dovetailed into the tax reform debate. But the fl flat tax was a Republican idea, right? I mean, there, there weren't any Democrats who were in favor of a flat tax, Actually, were there? there, there were some, uh, How about Robert Hall? Bob but Hall it wasn't was it was a distributionally neutral in the sense that uh, no, uh, Bradley, already, who, well, I mean, the, but that the, was the, the that was the Bradley argument. Have almost no behavioral changes in them. For example, I mean, they don't; they're inadequate at best. For example, uh, if you double the the uh, capital gains tax, we'll get just as many capital gains, but people will just sit down and write bigger checks. On the contrary, if you double the capital gains tax, guys like me won't sell any stocks. Well, <laughs> just I think period. Gephardt was really a response to, to the flat tax. tax. Exactly. That's yeah. what I was trying I to say. I think so earlier. too. Yeah, they the had a big tax influence. Debate with Dupont and, and these articles you're talking about. Right. That was eighty one, eighty two. It would be early, and Reagan more than once, at least in my memory, came out. I mean, maybe it wasn't in big programs or Saturday talk. I mean, Saturday uh, radio broadcast or whatever. But it was the Republican Party, I think, understood that Ronald Reagan was for, for a flat tax. Well, he wanted he supported those ideas because he, he loved, as, as we all did, uh, the, the typical kind of Chamber of Commerce speech against the lawyers and the accountants and that it takes 10 people to do your taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And whether it's send it in on a postcard, all those different things that we were all talking about, we were talking about a lot of those kinds of ideas based on the articles you're talking about before we got into it was a way to talk about cutting tax rates in a budget constrained environment Hence which revenue couldn't neutrality. exactly right. that, exactly yeah here's how jack put uh, in, in an article um, after he lost the um, race for the 1988 uh, presidential nomination he said for example on the economic issues we began with the tax and spending victories of 1981 but almost immediately a backsliding began, supported by Republican status quo managers and Democrats alike. In the new post-Kemp Roth climate, it took the form of closing loopholes and revenue enhancement rather than tax rate increases. But these tax increases occurred on a yearly basis, 1982, 1983, 1984, until some of us mounted a counteroffensive by joining insurgent Democrats to put through a rate-cutting tax reform. The tax increasers extracted their price, Ridiculous complication rather than simplification, um, but we did get the rate down from marginal income tax rate down from uh, to 28 from 70 percent in 1980 and doubled the personal exemption to 2,000 dollars. So uh, this was it was both political and economic. I, th I think the, the dynamic point that Bruce raises is, is is critical here because there's really very rapid growth of real revenues in the 80s because there was rapid growth in the real economy over four percent and uh, and. But it, and the share of GDP going to individual income tax is surprisingly constant, around 18, around 8 percent of GDP. Um, and that was true when the rates were 70, and it's true when the rates were 28. We get about 8 percent of GDP. But if GDP is growing faster, then your revenues are growing faster in real terms. So the key thing is, do you have a structure in place that's conducive to economic growth? And we did. And 86 was so successful in some ways, uh, despite the controversy among the capital formation crowd that it was emulated all over the world. And we had massive rate reductions. Almost every uh, LDC uh, uh, developing country uh, cut their top tax rates in half. India went from but 60 to 30. The itself was done in, in static revenue neutral terms. Yes, and, and, and but the, where they thought they were going to get revenue was from the capital gains tax and the corporate tax, and they didn't. They got it from the lower individual rate. Primarily. So, so Senator Kasten, how did you get involved in this in this whole thing? What the, who approached? We who? weren't part of the. Well, Jack and I had been working together since when I was in the House of Representatives in the early 1970s, and kind of the beginning of this, for me at least, was at that time the I was in the House of Representatives. The Republican delegation from Wisconsin was two, Bill Steiger and Bob Caston, and at, when I came <coughs> to the House in '74. Bill and Jack were already talking and working on things like reducing the capital gains tax. I joined into that debate, and from that point, Jack and I became friends and co-sponsored each other's legislations and bills and, and whatever. And then, 
Uh, this morning we were talking about how Jack reached out and helped people. Um, I think starting in 75, he was in Wisconsin at least once a year, uh, bumping around in an airplane, in and out of Waukesha or Oconomowoc or wherever, helping me. And uh, in 78, I ran for governor, lost. In 80, I ran for the Senate, won with Jack's help against Gaylord Nelson, and that was the year that we took over the Senate. At that point, we started talking together about the opportunities, whether it was capital gains tax reduction, all the other kinds of, of efforts, and the people like John and others were you know, involved in this. My staff person at that point was Dawn Gifford, who had been a former Kemp staff person, came on our staff in part because of her experience, limited experience, but her experience, experience with John and, and Jack. And so, as I said earlier, we we've also were considering capital gains tax reduction, we were considering enterprise zones, we were considering other kinds of positive changes that more than anything else, I think that the, the thing that brought all of our thinking together was incentives, that, that incentives affect human behavior and they can make a positive difference in our government and in our society, and uh, that people respond to incentives and that uh, we need to put more incentives in different ways, whether it's enterprise zones or tax reduction or capital gains tax reduction, whatever, but the, the, the overriding theme was incentives. Um, so, um, Don Regan is studying uh, tax reform during the all during 1984. So, was the Kemp staff or Kemp himself in touch with Don Regan and the other people who were working on that? And did he have a, a sort of a dialogue while that was underway? Well, we were following uh, what was uh, happening in the development of, of Treasury One, uh, and. Uh, because we, we knew a lot of the people who were in the administration. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of input. We thought that what we saw, the rates were coming out rather too high. Um, their, their rate came out actually above 35%, but they shaved it uh, just kind of arbitrarily. Um, and that was too high for Jack. We thought 35% was, we could do better than that. And uh, in, as indeed we did, but it took over an awful lot, a lot of but so the fascinating thing about that period was, uh, and I think this was mentioned this morning, you had uh, Reagan call for tax reform because he thought Mondale was going to, and in fact Mondale wasn't going to. He didn't like the idea. He didn't, it didn't fit with his politics at all. Uh, and then you had Reagan say, report back to me in December 1984 after the election. And which caused derisive laughter. Laughter at the, the State of the Union address, which doesn't happen right. very often. So <laughs> clearly... <laughs> does now, maybe. <laughs> Didn't in those days. So we're talking about a different Washington, right? So, so uh, uh, b which just raises the point that nobody, it, it, in fact, this, there's a personal piece to this. The reason I was like cub reporter at the Wall Street Journal, the only reason I was allowed to cover the damn thing was because nobody thought it was going to happen. Uh, the president didn't think it was going to happen. The... Uh, uh, so did, did you all think it was going to happen, or did you feel like uh, you were pressing a futile lever? I thought it was going to happen. I mean, I, 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 I had been involved in the 81 tax reform, and whenever anybody says it's something is politically impossible, I can just say, you know, well, I've been uh, part of at least two uh, initiatives that were politically impossible <laughs> until the day they happened. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it was going to happen. We also thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Right. economically and politically. It was the right thing yeah, for us to right, do right. as Republicans. We thought we had the politically, sensitive, yeah, uh, look at the Jeff Bell arguments, I mean, the d debates with Bill Bradley, whatever. We thought those debates around the country would be helpful to us as Republicans. We also thought we'd be doing the right thing. Yeah. So there wasn't, there wasn't a downside. Yeah, we, we hoped it would happen. Whether we believed it would happen or not, maybe. We certainly thought there was a good chance because the president was for it. When, so on when the political it, side, uh, you had it going on in the summer of 84, the Republican convention, and the biggest issue in the Republican convention was a comma. What? The district comma. comma. <laughs> oh, yeah. What, in the draft. Tell us about that. And the drafts, what you would do with the drafts is you, we would write up drafts. And Senator Lott, then Congressman Lott, was the chairman in 1984, and I was working for him then. And we would write up the drafts and send them to the White House. And they would keep coming back with things that equivocated on taxes. And on tax reform. On tax reform. On tax reform. This is as they're developing. Yes, and, it was, and the person who was reading them at the White House was Dick Darman. 
Mm-hmm. No, and, and Jim Chico, Chico, yeah. Pinkerton yeah. were behind the curtains, and, yeah. and, and I was the chairman of the, that subcommittee, that sub- and economic reform, and Dawn was, was my staff person. And we were always trying to make it unequivocal. And and language and so where was the conference? <laughs> 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 it literally got to the point where Senator Lott called <laughs> Jim Baker <laughs> and said, I don't want to see Dick Darman in Dallas, I don't want to hear that he's in Dallas, and I don't want to hear that he calls anybody in Dallas. The only person he can talk to is me. Nobody else at any time, and I don't want him there. And he wasn't. He was in May. The language in question was a sentence that said, we oppose tax increases which would hurt economic growth. And so um, I f- forget who it was that uh, realized that Bill inserting uh, Bill Gribben, inserting a comma <laughs> after so tax increases, tax comma, yeah. we oppose tax increases, comma, yeah. which would hurt <laughs> economic growth. <laughs> <laughs> And that was a huge... And, and Darman was trying yeah. to keep the comma he was, out. Yeah, the whole thing was <laughs> about a comma, exactly. And, and we literally had, and as Senator said, he was the chairman of the subcommittee that was doing this in order to make sure we got through the whole process and, without this going and, wrong. And all the people that you talked about were the people advising us. I mean, for the, they were the people that had testified yes. in, the, in the hearings beforehand, your pool party, yeah. basically, <laughs> and, and the whole you know, group of... Uh, Group of other other people. It that was were that, and I think the gold plank was the other one. Yeah. Uh, a dollar as good as gold it was uh, a, a huge fight, but it stuck. But this is similar to the the uh, the the Bill Brock story we were talking about this morning. I mean, how much opposition was there within the Republican Party to uh, the idea of making tax reform central? I think that among the kind of traditional. I don't know what Bill said this morning, but among the kind of traditional Republican Party, I would say the, the, the static uh, Republican Party economic thinking, there was, there was a lot of concern about it. Um, Bob Dole was the and, one. And, and I, was, I would begin with Dole, and at that point was the chairman of the Finance Committee or ranking member during part of those years, basically chairman. And there was a lot of concern in corporate America about, about lowering tax rates. And maybe it's related to the issues that 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 that, that uh, you were speaking, Alan was speaking to earlier, that they weren't so sure. They kind of, we we were kind of like a group of uh, vigilantes out there on the edge, and we were we were you know we really weren't in the main line where everybody wanted us, and especially that 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 platform, because because that you know we were trying to make a statement there, and and. Uh, all of a sudden, it came from from the uh, from the but, administration. But, but, your, but tax tax reform, if it's if it's going to be revenue neutral, does raise taxes on some people. So that comma um, would imply that you're not going to raise tax, which is now religion in the Republican Party. Never raise taxes on anybody, right? So um, the the um, w- what tax reform would do would be to lower the rates, but also raise taxes by closing loopholes. So how does that, how does that square well, this here? This is not a Grover Nyquist interpretation, debate, yeah. interpretation in those days that you can't close any loopholes. The whole idea of tax reform was to close loopholes to get the rates down. But there we were people who were defenders. Tax. We but, but, there, fair but, tax. but there were defenders of the loopholes who were oh, absolutely. Republicans. Absolutely. The whole, as I understand it, the whole House Ways and Means Committee Republican. Well, if you were group. on the Ways, Com- Ways and Means Committee and you'd been lobbied and entertained for all these years by uh, people who wants loop, want loopholes, I mean, this is the kind of discussions we used to have. Bob Packwood. Yeah, well, he so saw the light. Uh, he saw <laughs> the, the light. There's a real but simple way. And Rostenkowski is the yeah. same. There's a real simple way to describe what happened yeah. with the two bills. Yeah. Uh, corporate America was for the 81 bill. Corporate America was not in favor of the 86 bill until it became inevitable. If you ask a corporate CEO about taxes, he'll say, don't tax my company, tax my stockholders, my workers, and my customers instead. The trouble is that is the company. And the success of the company depends on their stockholders, their workers, and their customers. So this is, gets to the, to the yeah, individual the, versus the, the corporate. The political attitude was different back in those days. I mean, compare GE's non-payment of taxes in 82, which was a scandal, and its recent non-payment of taxes, which was nobody gave a crap about. Also, it wasn't entirely true. Well, that's beside the point. I'm talking about the political reaction was very different, I think, in, in, over those over that time period. Uh, people reacted, were, were very upset that, that corporate America was getting away without paying its fair share. And today, I think people are really much more 
accepting of the idea that uh, that uh, corporations don't pay taxes, individuals pay taxes. Or much more cynical. About, well, however you want to put it, I'm not sure. About our government and our corporations. Well, GE builds windmills, so it's got to be a good company. <laughs> and they get exactly. tax credits for building. Right. They get tax credits for And they're good at nuclear money. power, too, right? Yeah. As Bill Bradley mentioned, uh, there were some joint events uh, between uh, Kemp, uh, Senator Kasten, uh, Bill Bradley and uh, Dick Kephart, and one of those, at least one of those events, was to bring together about a dozen business leaders who were for for it and try and uh, point out that there were winners uh, as well as losers in the in the event. But yeah, it was it was uphill because it was not a, a consensus thing, and, and in the end, it, it turned out to be difficult. Of course, just to get more businesses began filing as individuals well, under Subchapter S. Was Kemp at all on the outs with the with the uh, Reagan administration because he opposed Tefra and you know? other tax raisers in the interim. I mean, he was against all those I, I think that, tax um, increases, right? Reagan mentions in his, in his um, biography uh, Jack's opposition to TEFRA, but it was in the context of, um, it, was supposed to, it was supposed to be a deal in which uh, we got $3 worth of spending cuts to $1 of tax increases. And this, Reagan bought this argument, and he says in his, of Jack's uh, opposition, that he, Jack, Kemp is being unreasonable. But in fact, in the, the event, diary, the diary. The, the, in the diary, which is yeah. winds up in, in his in his autobiography, uh, but in fact, Kemp had a correct assessment of what was going on that we weren't going to get the spending reductions, we were going to get the tax increases, and uh, and didn't Reagan the, come back later and realize he didn't yes. get them? I mean, he, yeah. and he said he didn't necessarily say opposition was right, but he did say he did he say was, he was, maybe he disappointed in or yeah. we never got the exactly. or we got that first and never got the reductions next time. We've got to get the reductions first. I can't remember how he yeah. said it, but you know, there was something, to say that. Yeah. There's something ahead, like Dave. that. Yeah. There was in this time a growing feeling that, uh, that President Reagan never held a grudge against anybody. I mean, he might just oppose you, but you know, the next fight's the next fight, and we're all good guys, and we're, you know, he was. That wasn't the feeling people had about the White House staff. <laughs> <laughs> These guys took names, and mm -hmm. they had lists, and they looked at them every night before they went home and turned off that light in the office. And so you had a, a, a feeling that there, you know, there might be somebody who was going to make you pay for this later on. Mm -hmm. This is Baker and Darman you're talking yeah. about. But and then, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, but then they become allies. That, yeah. that was exactly right, except that we all believed, and I know Jack believed and I believed, that President <laughs> Reagan, if he made the decision, would be on our side, not the side of, 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 of the staff. Yeah. We, we, we believed that, and frankly, yeah. in different ways, shapes, and forms, yeah. Reagan told us that personally yeah. and, and, and to wider audiences. Well, so is that why then, so then after the election, Baker and Darman then moved to the Treasury and owned tax reform after having fought you at the convention? I mean, did you, uh, did you feel like that was the end of it at that point, or? Well, I don't. I didn't feel that way. I mean, I, John no, was more I, dealing on the detail with them because yeah, well, then we started getting down to to, to real. You know, how did this work? The uh, Baker Darren uh, Treasury was constantly creating problems to the uh, Kemp Kasten or Bradley Gephardt type approach, um, undercutting uh, the efforts to double the personal exemption, for example. Um, Baker and Darman came to Jack's office and. Um, Secretary Baker sat sideways on his couch with his feet, at, with his cowboy booted feet up, and uh, Darman sat next to him and ex tried to explain to us that it was impossible to raise the personal exemption, which was then $1,080, to more than $1,300 without imposing a value added tax. And uh, so that set the, the task for me to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, and, but he, he, every step of the way through the, um, the process, uh, they were always trying to reduce the, the deductions, and especially the standard deduction, and uh, kept we, the rate part too high. Uh, but we talked about this this morning. I mean, they also were, uh, so Baker and Darman, as the legislative process begins, their work in the House, they are working with the Democratic majority. They kind of stiffed the Republican minority, but they always kept Kemp in the loop, didn't they? They had to, they needed uh, Jack. We, we needed each other, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, Kind of a, a team of rivals uh, approach uh, to it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you might say that. Uh, we uh, Baker's attitude, I think, was he he wished that he tax reform had never been dropped in his lap. <laughs> but because uh, he and the president were on the line as uh, for it, that he was going to try and make it work. 
but um, Dick Darman was always uh, too clever by half, and uh, you always had to find out which half was <laughs> was. Uh, yeah, yeah, let, let me. I will make one point, and then John will will tell you how he figured it out so that they uh, they got the two thousand, because the two thousand became a very important symbol as you went through this process of what you're going to do f for individuals and families, and for uh, a lot of Republicans in the House, uh, this was the the growth. You, you had some <coughs> more majority and some other things on the economic side. What they cared about more than anything, now they were in favor of tax cuts, tax cuts, but what what happened to the family? And the 2000 was an article of faith. And you had a whole lot of House members for whom this was an article of faith. And it became clear as we went through this that um, the Treasury Department w did not believe it to be an article of faith in any way, shape, or form. And so um, there was a column at that time in the Washington Times called Alice on the Potomac. And nobody knows who wrote it, except a couple of us who know who wrote it. <laughs> who wrote it? Who wrote it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who wrote it? Uh, Dick Thompson wrote it, and um, he Dick had to deal with it. He was uh, he was had Jim, been Jim McClure's uh, chief of staff, and then he had been the uh, head of the policy committee under Senator Tower, and he had to deal with them that he would write it as long as they told nobody who wrote, because he if it had ever been found out, he was going to be fired, and that was it, and he knew it. Mm -hmm. But he was able to put things in. So I talked to Dick, and I said, "Let me tell you what's going on here." So he was reporting all the way along what the Treasury Department was doing to try and undermine the 2000. And it was making the Treasury Department sort of unhappy because they couldn't figure out who was doing it and who was being told and where it was coming from. And they kept getting uh, you know, groups of House Republican congressmen s screaming at them. You know, we know you're doing this. And they'd, if they'd say no, they couldn't make it stick because all this stuff was appearing in the newspaper. Why did Jack Kemp believe that the 2000 personal exemption was so important? I don't think I could answer that. I, I mentioned that there was, the original version of supply side really focused only on physical capital, but I think Jack got the human capital argument that, that, that people are just as important as machines, and in fact, uh, investment in people provides about two-thirds of our economy, and uh, investment in pr uh, property only about one-third. And uh, so he saw it as a pro-family issue, but also as a fairness issue. Uh, under the, the tax code then, you were taxed even though you were below the poverty level, and you were not uh, made whole if you were raised uh, uh, children. And uh, it was a question of just um, simple fairness in treating humans at least as well as machines. And uh, that was uh, the impetus. And uh, it was not easy to figure out how to pay for it, but we worked on the House side especially with uh, Congressman Henson Moore, who was on the Ways and Means Committee, the uh, Rossing County version sh uh, cut the personal exemption to $1,500, and I think uh, less even for, for dependent children, and they raised the top rate uh, to 38% uh, by keeping a lot of other junk. And Henson Moore, uh, 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 after working with us, proposed amendments a few times in the committee to restore the $2,000 exemption, uh, and I was uh, able to figure out how to do it. It, turns out, it turned out that um, the distribution of um, the personal exemption, uh, the reason Darman said it could not be increased was that people only have children when they, they can afford to have children. So if you were increasing the personal exemption, uh, apparently it meant that you were skewing the tax cuts toward the upper middle class. Uh, but what I found by looking at the revenue uh, figures in detail was that the distributional um, distribution of the personal exemption was about the same as the consumer interest deduction. And it, it suddenly made sense to me why this is. You, if you're going to pay for your kid's college tuition, you pay for a car or a house, you can pledge the car or the house, it, your, your bank can take it over, but you can't do that with your kid. And so I realized that what people were doing was, was borrowing against their house or their, or their, their boat and uh, deducting the interest and writing that off their taxes. And so the answer seemed to be clear, double the personal exemption and get rid of the consumer interest deduction. And it, was, it turned out to be kind of a wash. We had a s smaller s uh, standard deduction, but a larger personal exemption. So to Morton's question, though, about you know, why, why, was this, why was there so much passion around this issue? I mean, if supply side economics was about incentives, what was the incentive behind 
the doubling of the personal deduction. It's an incentive to have more kids. But Paul Bluestein once told me, and with a laugh, that's the ultimate supply side. It just <laughs> have, have more kids. Well, I, was also a whole I was, I worked on a, I should mention, I, uh, under Paul Weirich's, with Paul Weirich's cooperation, I worked on a, uh, a pro-family coalition that uh, about 30 different groups that was just focused on the need to double and then index the personal exemption. And we went in and had a very interesting meeting with Bob Packwood, who was not known as a big pro-family advocate that I could get to later. But uh, there was a big, the pro-lifers, the social conservatives were very big on doubling the personal exemption. And we brought that political power to bear on the process. Bring the social and the economic issues together, whereas previously they'd been separate. Now it's- we Was that the way Kemp thought about it? It was an yeah. opportunity to, to, an to heal I, the divide? I think John said it right when he said that there's a fairness issue as well as a pro-family issue well, for he Jack. Got, he, he, he's a different in, constituency, in, the pro-family group is a different bunch of people. They're not necessarily supply well, siders. Different from what? Well, they're, but, but they're making one, everything in this do bill as a supply, supply side. Yeah. That wasn't, I don't think it was, but it was a fairness issue. I disagree. You think it was, okay. Bluestein got yeah, it. Anecdotally, Jack told <laughs> all about it. Somebody asked him, said, you know, they were saying they were talking about Cato and heritage, and Jack said, well, the difference is this. Um, at Cato, they don't have kids, and at heritage, they do. <laughs> <laughs> David, grandkids, yeah. We have grandkids at Cato. David, during this time, didn't you and John and others in, develop a certain, that there was a, it was almost a disincentive for people to be together? To, there, were, there, were, there were, if I remember, we had statistics and things saying that if these two people are separated and she's taking yeah. all the deductions, et cetera, that if he moves back into the house, their income, and, and we had that, Jack had that in head, Jack had that in his head, I had that in my head, and we had the, I don't know exactly what the numbers were, but we, we, we took examples of where people were better off if they were on government assistance, particularly. Yes. That, that, that there was a disincentive for the family to remain together, and that we believed was wrong. So once again, it's an incentive, and the government had the disincentive. So the umbrella here, the thing that brings it all together, is incentives make a difference. Yeah. And we wanted to have incentives to have a family together. But, but politically, was, this was an appeal to the, to the pro-family, right to life, whatever that, that group is. Sure. As opposed to, now, to what extent was it a populist thing? In other words, it would appeal to Democrats who were at the bottom of, you know, more likely to be at the bottom of the scale. Um, What's the balance there would, in it Kemp's was, mind? It was, in fact, a way to go across party lines because uh, labor income is simply the, re the return on investment in human, ca in human beings. And uh, um, Republicans, as I, as I indicated, are uh, less dependent, but Democrats are more dependent on labor income, especially as you get toward the bottom. So it was a way and of- Kemp was con conscious of oh, this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And Democrats like Pat Moynihan agreed with us. This was part of the- the underpinnings of a lot of his thinking. Okay, so uh, the bills are all introduced. Uh, the legislative meat grinder is going. Uh, what is Kemp's role in the 85 process? Again, he's, he's, not, a, a, uh, he's not a member of Ways and Means. Um, presumably, he is now leadership. He's now in the leadership, and it, presumably, he has more status than he had in, in 81, but what what, so what role did he take with the Ways and Means people? What, what, and what role did he, what, what was his relationship to Rostenkowski in particular? Well, Rostenkowski um, kind of had a, a, he looked down, I think, on more junior, junior members in either, in either house. He was kind of um, sensitive about uh, his prerogatives. But uh, Jack had a good re working relationship with him, I think because of his, uh, uh, pro-labor uh, credentials. Um, uh, Jack was working at the same time, as I mentioned, with Ensign Moore in the House. He was talking to uh, um, Bradley a lot, having uh, joint events with Bradley on both taxes and uh, uh, monetary policy in 80, uh, uh, late 80, it was in 85 and 86. So they're working on, on a couple of different issues together. And uh, so he, uh, and he was writing memos or calling them on the phone all the way through the process during the House, uh, the House enactment and then afterwards on the Senate side. Politically, there were a lot of House Republicans particularly. I wouldn't, you can speak to the Senate better than I can, Senator. The House Republicans who, if Jack Kemp said no, it was no. 
If Jack Kemp said yes, it was yes. And there were a pretty good block of those. And they, they looked to Jack. On tax policy, they didn't look to Barbara Conable. They looked to Jack. Mm -hmm. Not that they didn't respect Barbara Conable, and he was an intelligent, and but, fair, and decent man, but Jack Kemp was their leader. But so what, during that period as it's moving through the House, what's the mechanism for that input to get into the process? Was it, were there periodic meetings with the Treasury that Kemp was involved in, or what was the? Well, there were, there were leadership meetings on the Republican side where you would have the ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee and the leadership meeting and talking about these issues. So, so Jack had a chance in that forum um, to make sure his views were known and Barbara Conable understood it. In addition to which, John was doing a lot of back and forth with the Ways and Means staff. Um, usually they had to check their guns at the door before they went into any meetings or made phone calls. <laughs> but there were a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth where John would be providing things and they'd but critique they, him coming back. If you look at the Ways and Means Republicans, were they, was there any, was there much support for tax reform there or were they mostly trying to undermine the effort? I, I think there was support for tax reform there. Now exactly how it went, for Henson Moore, as John has already brought up, uh, was, and, and frankly, I don't remember that, that uh, Mr. Conable was in any way opposed to it. He just, I mean, it was sort of, this is where we were going, and he was a good soldier, and he was going to do it. Um, the thing, so. though, is, is that by tying uh, Darman, tying this uh, it's Treasury staff, Treasury to Ross and Kowsey, that kind of tied their hands because it wound up with a, a rate that went higher and a personal exemption that went lower as we went through the process. And as Moore's uh, amend amendments were defeated, then the House Republicans became more and more disaffected with the whole process. They didn't trust Darman uh, as far as they could throw him. And uh, so by the time it got to the final bill, which had a 38% top rate, a reduced uh, personal exemption, um, re reduced incentives for capital formation, yeah. it, was, it was just too much for them. And the result of that was when it was brought up in December, just after Thanksgiving recess in 85, they brought it to the rule to the floor, and the rule was defeated. Right. It was much easier to right. vote against the rule than it was to and get into the tax bill. And that's a crucial. That's a yeah. crucial moment. And, and, that and Jack Kemp votes against it. He votes now, against it. Well, I think it was virtually unanimous Republican vote against the rule. And, and the argument, the argument at that time for voting for it was keep it going, get it to the Senate, uh, and improve it in the Senate. Except, except that Packwood had announced the morning of the vote that if once he got the bill, he wasn't going to do anything with it. <laughs> that it was going to be basically the the Rosenkowski bill. And that was just too much. Uh, we, and did pa Packwood did that in part because he didn't particularly want the bill, did he? he was, yeah, he was not enthusiastic. He was not in favor of the raise. So you have a but whole series of people I, here who didn't want the bill. I don't think this was, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I wasn't in the House, but I think that the answer to your question is this in part was an inside job with Jack Kemp working with the, with the Ways and Means Committee and John and others working with the staff. But I think it's important. And Jeff being a go-between between Jack but, and Bradley but, as well. But it's also, there is a huge outside job going on that was going on outside, the first, for sure, outside the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee. There was a whole going on in the Republican Party and in the business community, in the Wall Street Journal, in other places, that, that was developing momentum for a decent bill. Mm -hmm. So when it came to all of a sudden the average congressman had to vote, the average Republican knew from what they had read over the last six months and what they'd been learning about through the Republican National Committee, through President Re whatever, that this was not what, so, and so it's not just the inside game, there was a big outside game going on that was very successful. Now there, between those two votes, because there was a second vote taken on virtually the same bill on the rule about a week, ten days later. And in that time, a couple of things happened. I will tell you an anecdote of one of them, and John can tell you on the substantive side what was going on. And I remember vividly, uh, if you've been inside the Capitol on the House side, in the front, eastern front side, there's a stairway that goes up, and it goes up to the third floor where the Rules Committee is. And it was sometime fairly late at night, and Jack's running up, and I'm following him, and John's following me. And I'm taller than Jack was. And I'm taller than, ja than Dick. <laughs> <laughs> but Jack was somewhat wider in the shoulder than I was. But he's also and higher up in the stairs. He was, he was two <laughs> stairs ahead of me. And, I, and I'm just, I'm going, you can't vote for this. You cannot vote for this rule. It's terrible. This bill is just as bad as, <laughs> and he turns about halfway up there. He turns on his heel and he lean, he's leaning over me. So I'm 
You know, a head shorter than his, and he said, I am going to vote for this bill. There were nothing will stop me. We must move this forward. We can't stop tax reform here. Now shut up. I don't want to hear another word out of you. <laughs> and you sort of, ah. <laughs> so, shut up. But that's a complete turnaround from 10 days earlier it on, the, as you say, the same bill. It was. Well, it was, but it was only with uh, um, assurances from Reagan that Reagan would veto the, uh, the substance if it was not fixed, uh, according. And, and uh, fixed meant. It's 35% 2000, 2000 and, was and one no of them. higher uh, capital cost than Treasury one. And he got the first two in a letter from Reagan and the third in a letter from Baker. And that saved the bill. And that's the an that was the antidote to Bob Packwood saying, I'm going to pass the bill the way they Packwood immediately me. accepted the ground rules and went to work. But it's Bob. To remember that one of the things that was <laughs> irritating the Republicans at that time is that the Treasury had this habit of primarily negotiating with the Democrats because they were in the majority. And so there was a tendency to treat the Republicans as if they were just gonna rubber stamp and it was up to the Treasury to do the negotiating on behalf of the Republicans. And I think there was very much a revolt against that kind of, you know, Mentality, not being, yeah. you know, treated uh, uh, poorly. And, and one of the reasons for the vote against the rule was to get Treasury's attention and say, you better give us some attention and not just spend all of your time with Danny Rostenkowski. So, so was it Kemp who invited Ronald Reagan or insisted? How, how did it go well, to, was very much involved in that particular to get case. Reagan to come up well, to address the, the House Republican conference? Gingrich was actually heading the, part of the effort, heading the effort to just kill it and uh, start, start over, over again. Yeah. But uh, Jack um, got on the, the horn to uh, the White House to get Reagan, the assurance that Reagan would come and address the, the, the House Republican conference, which was a, a, a risky um, uh, move for... Uh, who did he, so, so he... It was a hostile he, group. He, uh, call, he calls down to Regan. Is Regan still White House Chief of Staff? Regan was the high, was chief, yeah. Yes, he yes. was. At that point, he was. So he, so he, Regan presumably was a supporter of this whole effort, right? Because he'd invented the, the plan. And there's a, 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 a did tension Kemp between... Talk, did Kemp talk to Regan in this case, or did he talk to Reagan, or who did he talk to? I think the there White were leadership meetings where... Um, I, I know there was a leadership meeting with uh, Michael and Kemp when they uh, drafted a letter for the president uh, to, uh, uh, to send to the Republican conference, and that was sent from them to the White House at the same time they were asking Reagan to come down and address the uh, Republican conference. And it was, it was a fluid, fluid situation, so it wasn't clear what, what was going to work, but that was, Jack was trying different things. Russell has a question. Uh, uh, a subtext to all of this, in, in relation to your question about the larger community, is, that, is Republican presidential politics for the next election. I'm just curious about the extent to which the positioning on, uh, uh, for, for a presidential campaign is a factor, if at all. Was it just a, the presumption that, that uh, uh, Bush would be the nominee, and, and was he at all a, a player in, in these efforts? Well, we were certainly uh, on Jack's staff operating under the impression that he was going to run for president in, in 1988, and uh, certainly ha having yes. uh, and certainly having been uh, a leader in the tax reform effort, and having been a leader of the pro-family. Movement was were central themes to his uh, but, campaign. But Russell asked a really interesting question. I can't recall any intervention by the vice president. Who was I, Jim Baker and Dick Darman? Who were they? You mean who were they acting on behalf of? I I don't think they were acting on. I would argue they weren't acting on behalf of him. But there were very few people in town who didn't feel that if you started separating out Republicans and where they'd go with people who might be candidates in 1998, that 1988, excuse me, it was clear that, that the Treasury Secretary and Mr. Darman would be headed very supportive of, as one would expect, of the Vice President. Um, and so people just assumed that, that but <coughs> to, to, could I point to any single thing where the Vice President was involved in this? I cannot. I, 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 if there was, I have no idea what it was. Okay, but it just, well, yeah. and once again, he was loyal to the president and loyal in a, in a very deep and heartfelt way. Um, and it served him well in 88. Were there any other Republicans in the mix at this time who were trying to uh, either kill it or support it as, as one of their signature issues? Well, Dole, then. But Dole was leader already. 
uh, Dole was, by this time, Dole was the Republican leader, yeah. the majority yeah. leader of the Senate. Both his first and, year. Yes. Both and Packwood and Rostenkowski went through brief moments where they thought they might run for president yeah, at some yeah. point. Yeah. I mean, and so you had <laughs> Dole, who clearly was thinking about that, but once again, he, he, I, he, at least to me, he tended to leave things on the House side of the House. He had a lot of a lot of business to do over on the Senate side, he knew it. In addition to which, having been chairman of the Finance Committee, he didn't, he wouldn't have liked it if Howard Baker had stepped on his toes, and, and Senator Baker did not do that. And he didn't want to step he, on Packwood's toes. Deferential. He right. was deferential to his chairman. And, and bullied with him. But yeah, fair. yeah. Did and you, yes. I don't know if it was in the letter that you talked about, John, but the key to all this wasn't, at one point, Reagan said he would veto the bill. Yes. If yeah. Yeah, the rates right. came That's at the point. end of the whole mix. So we basically, or it was decided to let this go and see. But if it doesn't get fixed, we know we've got Reagan That's right. as Reagan the veto. Was involved in the process and, and was, he was, he was the there, one thing that Jack could bring made because it possible for it to get across to the Senate. The only reason supply side worked was because you had uh, two people believing it uh, at the opposite ends of Pennsylvania Avenue: Ronald Reagan in the White House and Jack Kemp in the Congress. Most of the people at either end did not agree <laughs> with with them. And we're often trying to uh, no. trying to undercut. But when, uh, so when Jack Kemp votes against the rule the first time, is this because, as part of a strategy, because Bill Bradley called over there and said, "What are you doing?" Um, and uh, the question is, was this part of a strategy to get Reagan involved in this, turn Treasury around, get that letter, and then he knew that he was going to vote for it if if that came about? Or did he change his mind? I don't think uh, anybody had th thought that far ahead. Things were happening very quickly at that time. I mean, first of all, you've got this bill. Secondly, you've got s questions among the House Republicans. Thirdly, you've got Packwood making a statement, and then you've got a vote. And it just, I mean, it just blew away from anybody's ability to, to control in that day what was going on. Quickly after that, people said, you know, Jack, in his yeah. mind, wanted it to go on. But what he had in front of him at that moment was something he couldn't support in the end, if that's what had come out. And it looked like there was nothing else. Well, several things happened, as John pointed out, that made it possible to say, OK, this does continue a process that can have a good end. But as you sat there that morning at 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock on the day of that vote and started going through it, nobody on the Republican side in the House could feel that this was going to come to a good end. And you, but you two obviously did not believe that this could come to a good end. Right? I didn't. John may have. <laughs> I didn't. And I, I, I can was, tell you, I, I prepared well, spoken, in, I prepared in, 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 too, right? in February and uh, no. and March to say to Jack, I told you so. I told you so. I, <laughs> and at the end, I mean, literally, Packwood had a, a weekend in which, you know, the the epiphany yeah. came, and he 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 said, I'm going to try. I'm going to go for the gold. I was answer his question. Yeah. If there's one person that was affected, I think, during this little process by presidential politics, it might have been Bob Packwood. Yeah. Yeah. He thought that this was his opportunity to come to the, get the support of, if you will, the more conservative side, particularly the economic conservatives, in which he had a lot of problems. And I think if there was one person in this whole mix that was thinking president, you can argue every senator uh, thinks I, president every day. They all think but, that. But this, I think that the, the, the idea that Packwood could link himself to Ronald Reagan, and Packwood could link himself to Jack Kemp, and Packwood was making speech. I mean, he was into this then. So and I think if there's one person that kind of fits into that category, it was he, it was he, Bob he, Packwood. I don't know where when other things in his life well, started uh, happening or whatever. I'll tell you one thing didn't work was, out. One thing that was in his life at that moment when he started uh, marking up the bill was a minister who was running against him in the Republican primary for re-election to the U.S. Senate. Now, I don't disagree with Bob that he ultimately thought about the presidency, but uh, that opponent eventually got somewhere around 40 or a little bit more percent of the vote, and that was in that pro-family coalition definitely played on that because Packwood, being the most pro-abortion member of the Senate, certainly on the Republican side, needed an offset politically to get the pro-family movement just enough off his back to survive in that May 1986 Republican primary in Oregon. So when did that, when did that transformation happen? I mean, you've already said that Packwood was sitting there in December 1985 hoping the thing would go down in the House so he didn't have to deal with it. The last thing he wanted was to deal with it. When he finally did take up the bill, it was 
the process was pretty ugly for a while. When, when did the transformation happen, and was it a positive transformation because he saw an opportunity, or a negative transformation because he thought he was going to get tarred with the failure and and have problems in that? I yes. Would look at yes. It. yes. <laughs> I think Clack would look at this as a positive opportunity, but I don't know about the exact timing or dates or whatever, but I think Bob Packwood looks at this as a positive opportunity, looked at this and still looks at this as a positive part no of question. his political career. So okay. this, the, 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 the famous uh, uh, three-pitcher three lunch, three lunch with uh, Dief Diefenderfer, his, his tax aide, uh, this happened, you think, because he, he because he of the combination of... The market up there was going bad. It was going down. Uh -huh. And I, I, I just, before yeah. we leave Kemp in December 1985, I want to say one thing about Jack's leadership. Uh, that second vote, when he switched to keeping the bill alive, nine other House Republicans voted with him. There were a total of 10 votes. I remember that vividly. It was the most counterintuitive thing I've ever seen a uh, politician do, and he was right. And how did his colleagues react? They were furious. With me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wrecked him over the coals at the at the. For but it, it, it was a brilliant it was a brilliant moment so for Kemp. So tell us about the raking over the coals. Well, we had a stormy uh, conference session um, mm -hmm. where all of his not just his re Republican rank and file, but his own lieutenant lieutenants were raking. You know, <laughs> 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 the belief was. I mean, last week we voted against it. The, uh, uh, you know. For all intents and purposes, this bill hasn't changed, and now you're for and it, for and they it. just won, and we're going down this horrible path. What? How can you be so selfish, so dumb, how can you believe, so gullible, whatever you want to say, and all those feelings were out there among his colleagues. And they what just, did he say? Well, Jack's speeches on, on both on voting on the rule and on persuading his, uh, enough of his colleagues to uh, go with the president the second time were both focused on those same three points, top rate, $2,000 exemption and uh, the cost of capital. Cost of capital. And uh, he voted against it because Ross and Kossi didn't meet those criteria. And Packwood had said that morning it was not going to change when it got to the Senate. And so he voted against it. But then when he got Reagan in involved and committing himself to veto anything that did not meet those three criteria, that was a key. But, the, but, but his colleagues don't believe him. Don't believe the president of the United States. They even said though it isn't Reagan, it's Jim Baker. Yeah. We don't trust him. I see. Well, and, and remember, those House Republicans at that time didn't know Bob Packwood was about to have, or had just had the weekend before, some kind of a major change of attitude. They'd known a Bob Packwood for 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever it was, years. It was very different from the Bob Packwood that we um, saw in the next yeah. six months. So you've explained why the $2,000 personal exemption was important. The top rate at this point is 50 percent. It's coming down to 38 percent. Why is that not good enough for the House Republicans? Um, because we could do better. I, I Jack thought we could do better. In fact, we did do better. We did he think, did anyone think you could get to 28 percent? No, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody thought no. But Camp Kasson had then. a 25 percent rate with, with a uh, 28 percent bubble. Your 28 percent was our Right, and, and that was the top, the top rate at the, in the final bill. Um, so can we go, talk can about the Senate a little bit? Yeah. Um, can I, can I just want to yeah. say one quick thing because I just want to get it on the, on the record because I think this, this has a lot to do with your question earlier about what the, what's the right rate and what were you guys thinking about and what was your, and just again out in Waukesha or Oconomowoc or Wausau, Wisconsin, and this was Jack's speech, it was my speech, it was Newt's speech, it was certainly Henson Moore's speech, we'd all say, and I think Jack started, one of you guys might have written it, but that we're opening a bakery, we're opening a bakery, and the only thing we sell is bread, and here is the, the way the tax system works. You're going to get taxed nothing on the first loaf of bread you sell. You're going to get taxed 10 percent on the second loaf of bread, 20, 30 percent on the second, third, et cetera, 90 percent on the ninth loaf of bread, 100 percent tax on the on the tenth loaf of bread. Now, how many of us are going to bake ten loaves of bread? Now that I said that speech, and Jack did, and Hanson did, and Connie Mack did, and that was, 
And we would then argue, and I would be in the Waukesha Rotary Club, and I'd say, okay, now one of you is smart and think, okay, I'll leave the oven on so I won't use the energy and I'll get that last loaf of bread out. It'll be the sixth loaf and it's worth it because I won't have to spend the energy. And so all of us are arguing in the room here about are we going to make seven or eight loaves of bread or maybe five or six. Who in the room is talking about making 11 loaves? Pause, stop. That was, our, that was the whole story. And, and that, that is the idea that Jack had not only, I'm not only thinking now about the Waukesha Chamber of Commerce or the Rotary Club, but I'm thinking about the way Jack th thought. Jack was thinking about not making the 11th loaf, but the 20th loaf or the 25th loaf. And why in the world has our government got, himself, got itself so tied up in knots that it can't figure out how to make as many loaves of bread? I mean, there are lots of reasons you can only make 10 loaves. But the tax system and the government is not the reason you should make only, anyway. I, we all did that speech. And that is not just the speech, but it also is Jack Kemp in terms of the way he thinks about the world. It was never, ever static. It was always your piece of pizza can grow at the same time that mine does because we are going to expand the diameter of the pizza. And those of you that covered him in speeches, that was the whole deal. and and. That, so there wasn't a right rate. The idea was if you could just, the, the marginal rate was the question, and don't prevent someone from working that extra hour of overtime. Don't prevent someone from making that extra loaf of bread. Don't prevent someone from taking that next job so that they can, because of the tax rate. There are other reasons why they shouldn't make that decision to make more money on the margin, but the tax rate should never be one. I was just having origin of that particular story or analogy uh, or, uh, you're talking about is Calvin Coolidge. If you look in uh, Andrew Mellon's book, uh, Taxation of People's Business, he reprints in, a, in an appendix a speech by Calvin Coolidge in which he says pretty much exactly that. And I don't know if I was the one who found it or whether Jude did, but, but, I, but, but Jack would all he loved, uh, I wish I had it in front of me. I mean, the exact wording he would repeat, and it, I guess over the years it just kind of morphed and, and all. But and Ray used it after uh, and, Jack. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm just saying it all goes back to Calvin Coolidge. I, I thought these guys were the smart guys. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out it's, so the other thing that was part of me. the other thing that was part of this speech every single time was when John F. Kennedy said. A rising tide lifts all ships. John F. Kennedy believed this. This is not a Republican idea. I never heard of the Coolidge part. But we always tied in Kennedy and Democrats. Mm -hmm. And Bradley, and to a degree, I don't know about Gebhardt, but Bradley didn't ever disagree with this kind of a analogy and this kind of a spin. The idea was that we want incentives in the system. Well, excuse me. We want to take away the disincentives and, and have opportunity in the system. There's a long history of the party seeing each other's clothes in the tax <laughs> issue, going back to the institution of the income tax in the first place yeah. under Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but uh, yeah, the um, uh, rates got up to 77% during World War I. Mellon uh, and Coolidge cut them. Uh, Kennedy reproduces the Mellon tax cuts. Reagan steals the, the, the Kennedy tax cuts, and that's the way it goes. So, so fast forward back to uh, 1986. Um, in, in, an incredible, so Packwood and Diefenderfer have their two-pitcher lunch at the Irish Times, and they come out and have managed to get a 28% a rate. And they did it with this, was it 27 when it came out of the? Final Senate passage. 27% uh, rate, but they did it with this incredibly crude instrument that those of you who are economists can't think was particularly elegant, the, the passive loss rules, which did in the end clobber real estate pretty severely. What was the reaction to that tactic at the time? Well, they, what they did, as I understand it, was simply um, come up with a concept uh, of two rates uh, and then turned it over to David Brockway and Eric Crook to figure, Cook to figure, it out. To figure out how, how to do it. And he looked at, at what was on the shelf or, you know, some of the, uh, once you put a, um, a revenue raising or reducing measure into the, 
into the system, it, it's there forever, which is why you know if you have a way to, to say pay for the $2,000 exemption, you put it in the House side, it's going to come out on the Senate, Senate side if they're struggling for revenue because that's just the way the, the process works. And uh, uh, so Brockway and Cook had the history as to how to do it. But the passive loss, uh, I'm not sure who, who glommed onto that, but it was, it was key to, to passing it. So that and did it, w I mean, was it, w did Kemp feel good about it, bad about it, or you get the rate down low enough, it doesn't matter? It was, if you got the rates down low enough, people would care less about, the de uh, about their, their deduction. deduction. What, what it most affected was investors in shopping centers. I, I talked to people who invested in shopping centers at the time in the 80s, and what they explained to me is we don't have bull markets and bear markets in our business. Because of the tax system, we always make money, no matter how crappy the shopping center <laughs> is, no matter how bad the location. That's what it was. That was the single biggest impact of uh, the repeal of passive loss is that if you invested in a shopping center, it might not work. You might lose money on it. Prior to that, you could not, literally, if you were liquid, you could not lose money so investing this is in a, a shopping center. This is a center. classic loophole. This is a loophole. This a is the very definition is loophole. of the loophole. Right. So, <laughs> the other thing is it represents fairness. I mean, the, it was called, one of the parts of this whole thing was called the fair tax, wasn't it? That was I can't right. remember. But ours was the fair and simple tax. Right. And, but we used fair all the time, fairness. And this was an example in which, in which clearly the, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as meant to be. It wasn't fair. One thing that I think is very important is the change in the tax on capital gains. Yeah. Is that it was... It was because that, that was the deal. I mean, that was part of the deal that brought the Democrats along, was tax and capital gains at the same rate as ordinary income. And again, the, there was a threshold rate that everybody was willing to live with, that they felt that it wasn't uh, <coughs> too onerously punitive to capital gains, and they were willing to buy the deal. But I think also... Was there, everybody willing to live with it? You talked this morning about splits, and the, was there a capital formation well, crowd I mean, that thought I capital mean, gains was, was too high? In, in the sense that they were willing to vote for it and enact yeah. it into law. But I think that there was also a feeling on the Republican part, or the conservative side, is that this is a temporary setback. You know, this is an issue that is so that we're so strong on politically, we'll just, the first opportunity, we'll just cut the rate back again. So I think it was very much of a, uh, you know, one step, you know, two steps forward, one step, whatever it is. Yeah. You know. Norman Ture uh, definitely thought the 86 bill was a bad idea. It was uh, getting rid of the loopholes was was bad, pure and simple, and that's... And, and just no one listened? No, uh, we just had enough votes <laughs> on both sides of the aisle to... Also, uh, it, it, to if uh, memory uh, serves, the way this happened in the Senate is you went through a markup which was day to day worse and worse and worse, and sort of at the end, Packwood said, okay, we're going to flip this. And then from that moment, every that weekend, it, it literally was like three weeks from there to the whole thing's right. done. And it happened so fast that all the people who might have tried to fight to get back in to fight this were sort of lost because once you got that rate that low coming out of the Senate, Greece. and that's where the president was, that just, the momentum of that was irresistible and they knew they had to move fast. So they yeah, did all so those things. Jeff and I were talking, what, the final vote was what, 93, 97, 97 whatever? 97 to 3. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the, final vote was just, the final yeah. vote was just overwhelming. I want to recall that I mean, it was just, situation. things were just yeah. really. Yes, by, by uh, all means, Jeff. Uh, it's middle of the night when it passes like 12, 15 in the morning, 20 yeah. zip. Uh, it was, uh, actually I was there for final passage. It was 97 to 3. I can't even remember who the three were in the U.S. Senate of 1986. Uh, but uh, I was, I remember, I remember the champagne that Bradley mentioned, but I also remember sitting in the gallery and Bradley's uh, only other two guests in the gallery uh, were uh, Fred and Linda Wertheimer, who were close friends of his. And <laughs> I said, my God, I'm in this with Fred Wertheimer, <laughs> the head of Common Cause at the time. And uh, I, I have to say that 97 to 3, and that was the 27 percent tax rate. The final passage once they had the conference committee in the Senate was 80 to 20 because people, they had a, a sense of perfection, of perfectibility in tax legislation that 17 people were able to bail out in the Senate between then and the final passage. I believe it was almost exactly 25 years ago when I was in the gallery with Bradley's wife and with Fred and Linda Wertheimer watching this 97 to 3. And uh, 
I think it was, uh, it, for me at least, it was a magic moment. It was just something that I will never see again and certainly had never seen before, that you could have such unanimity on such a radical change in the country. And I also think that important as Kemp Roth was, and I was, you know, as you know, I was an early campaigner on that and I believed in it, but I think that the impact of that overwhelming approval in the U.S. Congress and President Reagan signing it into law was the breakthrough element in the global change in tax policy. And I, I also believe that ending the punitively progressive, confiscatory progressive income tax was the key moment when socialism ended, as we know it. I think that there had been a transition earlier, it had been ownership of the means of production by the government. But after that, when that became somewhat unrealistic, it was high punitive income tax rates became the marker of socialism. And given what happened right after that magic moment, uh, globally, third world, Europe, everywhere, I mean, some areas more extensively than others, Alan said the most early at lunch that the most striking chapter in Jude's book was the chapter on the third world, where he explained how this could help but the little guy in the third world. In long before it actually exactly, happened. exactly. But it did happen. I mean, it actually did happen, and uh, I think it was uh, it was a, it was an extraordinary moment. It wouldn't have been possible without Ronald Reagan, Jack Kemp, and I believe Bill Bradley, who, as you could probably tell, we became fairly close. Uh, he was, he was an important how part did, of it, too. How did, uh, how did Kemp celebrate the, the win? Where did you, did you all gather? Did you? I don't remember, I, I don't remember baseball games. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> I, 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 Somebody I has to have I an anecdote. No, I, I, I literally do not remember gathering. He was, he was amazing, I mean, it was one of those things, I remember, you know, it just sort of, sort of a satisfaction that this is, you know, this is all, he sort of, Jack was so positive and, I mean, it just, it, if you failed at something, it was because you just didn't quite work hard enough. So we'll work a little harder and everything will work out. And he just, I think he felt part of this was, this was inevitable. I just had to force enough people to realize it along with me <laughs> that it was inevitable. But for most people, it went from impossible to inevitable the yeah. day of that Senate Finance Committee vote. 20 to nothing yeah. in the Senate and Finance Committee. Yeah. The finance vote before the Conference Committee vote. And it evolved. So it wasn't at the end, yeah. it wasn't that So no, surprise. you don't remember any celebration I, of that I, 20 I to zip vote? Sure. Was this, was this, uh, was this, was this the day, was this, this was the day of final passage or the day of the Senate? The Senate Finance Committee. I would think Senate Finance Committee. Although that happened at like 12.30 at, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning. The final vote was. I can't remember the 20 vote. This may have been the next day anyway. The 97 vote. We just decided to do something because it was so late. Things happened so late at night. We weren't yeah. sitting around because the House side, we weren't in. Yeah. The Senate was working late those nights. The House was not. So we tended to go home and watch things on C-SPAN. We had no social life. It was a sweet spot in tax policy in the Senate. Because it was between 1973 ordinary property income and capital gains. And there were people who didn't like uh, the e equality. And remember what uh, Bradley said in his interview about what would happen if you reintroduced a capital g lower capital gains rate, you'll wind up with a 39% top rate, and that's that exactly what happened. Well, where so where, just a minute, where was? The timing was, on that is all yeah. off. 39% yeah. rate comes in in 1993. The capital gains get, isn't cut until 1997. But the efforts began immediately. The effort began. The effort to cut and the capital Bush gains rate well, began Bush immediately. Bush revenues, revenues came in under under uh, significantly year after year under under the at the twenty eight. It was a revenue enhancing no, don't measure. Forget that Clinton did not raise the capital gains rate in ninety three. He delinked them here. That was very important. Where was Kemp? Where That's was right, Kemp? They delinked. So that Kemp yeah. Kemp is responsible for for this achievement, and then as Bradley said, immediately. 
the, the waves began to wash it away. Where was Kemp in the process as the, as the waves were washing it away? As uh, in, where was he on a capital gains differential? Did he support bringing back a capital gains differential? As I recall, he did. It, it, a couple of things happened here. Number one, you've got 1990, at which um, famously um, Dick Darman said to the social issue groups, it doesn't make any difference what promise he made. Nobody remembers this crap about not raising taxes. Oh, really? Well, two years later, he found out maybe two or three people remembered. So it washed away. You know, the guy was at 93% uh, 18 months before that. Um, so you had those, I mean, those, that going. Then you had a tax increase in 1993 that was done solely by the Democrats under Clinton. Then you had the budget deal in 1997. And the budget deal in 1997, um, at least my memory, I was working for Senator Lott at that time, uh, is that Jack was very much in favor of reinstituting this as something that would provide incentives since you were, you know, you weren't doing a lot on the tax side and they did a lot on the budget side uh, on that. But I remember a meeting that <laughs> Newt Gingrich and Trent Lott had with Erskine Bowles and uh, uh, Secretary of Treasury Robert um, Rubin. Rubin. Imagine you got two guys in this room who have made fortunes. <laughs> capital gains up and down, running businesses. And you have two guys in this room who are poor as church mouse, one of whom was a college professor, the other one who's been a member of Congress for the last 30 years. It was the worst example of setting up a meeting. And by God, they got it. They got the differential out of it. It was, it was I, I kept saying a lot when we went in the meeting, don't do this, don't do this. They said, don't worry, I've talked to Jack, I've talked to Jack. I know what to say, I know what to say. He sweet, did. <laughs> I would also argue that, that this is, if not the only, certainly one of the highest sweet spots in terms of Republicans and Democrats really seriously and honestly working together in recent legislative history. Well, so and what, the, what you just saw with Bill Bradley and, and if Jack were here or those of us that can speak to this, we were, we were not lying among, uh, staff wasn't lying to each other principles certainly were not lying to each other. We were absolutely trying to get this done. And Packwood bought on and 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 everyone it was it was a it was a it was not only Good a back. sweet spot in terms of economics, it was a sweet spot in terms of of, of nonpartisanship and good legislation resulting from it. Could that happen now? I don't think so. I think Why? You could. I think you could. If you had the right Forever legislation. the optimist. Well, the, the, if you had the right piece of legislation, the problem is that each party, um, each party is focusing on um, rewarding its base, both the Democrats and the Republicans. Republicans are trying to zero out the tax and property income, and the, the, the Democrats are trying to load all the taxes and property income and lower the. Uh, Let me make an interjection as a reporter who w uh, watched this. We've talked a lot about the people playing at the top level. One of the things that struck me about this whole process was that on the professional staffs, and Bill Bradley made a reference to this, the Treasury Department, the congressional professional staffs, uh, there wasn't a lot of partisanship, and they really worked very well together to try and figure out how to take these political impulses and mold them into so, and Brockaway is, was an example of that, but a lot of others as well. The fact that Ron Perlman could have been Ronald Reagan's tax guy and then move to the Hill and become Dan Rostenkowski's tax guy is the kind of thing that's sort of unimaginable to me now. I mean, the staff set up in Washington These guys today. They acted like appropriation staff people. Well, that's right. <laughs> they did. They acted like they, they, they were nonpartisan. <laughs> they were just trying to do the deal. Uh, that, that seems to be gone. The only way that anything like this could happen again would be, were, would be if the President of the United States, in the same way that Ronald Reagan did, would embrace the Simpson, Erskine Bowles, or group of six. Uh, there'd be a chance for some of this coming together because you've got some Republicans who are no tax increase Republicans that are part of that group of six and others that are carefully watching what's happening. But with the president ready to veto, and I don't know what the hell Schumer must be doing to Darman, I mean to uh, Durbin every day, but I mean watching that tension in the Democratic Party, it seems to me that the Republican, I mean, excuse me, that whatever the Republicans do doesn't make any difference because the Democrat president has decided 
he's going to be against his own Deficit Reduction Commission and three of his own Democratic colleagues, former colleagues and friends in the, in the Senate. Yet Obama made a deal with the Republicans on taxes, which shows he wants to get reelected. And to me, this, the fact that we, we have the American federalist system and that the president is the most important player in it because precisely because he has to get 50% plus one, and to do that, he's got to get his party as well as some of the other party and the independents. And you can That's argue what he should do that because he certainly isn't going to be affected by a, by a, by a Democratic. Nobody's going to run to the left of him, and nobody. There's no, I mean, he has a he has the nomination he absolutely question, tied is he up. A good enough politician to do it. Well, but, or does he want question. to? No, no. I, I think he could do it, and I think he could easily get reelected. He could. He's going to. Nobody's going to oppose him, with with the the, the the number of black voters in a Democratic primary. They're not going to. Nobody's going to beat him from the left. So he's got the Democratic nomination for sure. Does he want to be a leader? 20 years from now, as a person that crossed over to and took took and decided that the deficit was more important, and and he could he could bring it together, or does he want to stay with his with his particular ideology? First, I'd like to make a historical point here that I think is important, and that is that the '86 Act had predecessors in 1969 and 1976. In, in, in a tax reform process that began at the Treasury Department when Stanley Surrey came in as Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy. And if you go back and look, you'll see that when Kennedy put forward his tax proposal in 1963, it was essentially a tax reform effort. I mean, he had a whole bunch of loophole closers and stuff like that that just got stripped out in Congress. They weren't interested in that stuff at that time. And then you had the creation of the tax expenditures budget and you had the, uh, the focus on tax loopholes that was, was very intense that led to the Tax Reform Act of 1969, which was signed into law by uh, Richard Nixon. You had the Tax Reform Act of 1976 that was signed into law by Gerald Ford. And so the 86 Act you know, followed only 10 years after the last major effort, which followed only a few years before that. Now we've had you know, 25 years since the 86 Act and nothing remotely like it in between has happened. And part of what has been lost is institutional knowledge about the whole idea of tax reform, and which Rep Republicans law completely lost interest in uh, once they got control of the House and Senate and were able to get rid of PAYGO so they could just cut taxes. Why should we bother with tax reform? Who cares? We'll just cut taxes anyway we damn well feel like. But, but and Bruce, now it's only because the deficit has come back on center stage that has paralyzed the ability, uh, I think, going forward to have any kind of significant unpaid for tax cuts that now we're back in the same situation we were in early 82 where you, you have to talk about tax reform because it's the only game in town. But Bruce, uh, uh, Kennedy's tax uh, reform was, it was not a revenue neutral tax reform. It was, in static terms, it was minus 23% in rate reductions and plus 5% on tax reform. So there was a tax reform element to it, but it was essentially a rate reduction. I understand that. I'm just saying that there, there was a, I'm just saying there was a history of tax reform that dates back to 1963 at least of which the 86 Act would follow, you know, historically. Uh, and, 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 and since we've now had 25 years of no tax reform, I think that a lot of the knowledge uh, and understanding of the whole point of it has been lost. And, uh, and the, the whole staff situation is very different at the Treasury and at the Joint Committee and lots of other places. And I think that this is going to make it harder because a lot of stuff has to be relearned from scratch that was known in 1986, but has since been forgotten. What we're we, trying to do is help people relearn uh, what we want to know. So, we, so we've, we've uh, reached the end of our time, but so I will give anybody who feels the urge final word about Jack Kemp or about uh, the 86 tax reform to say his final piece before we, before we, we. We kind of skipped over Bob Packwood, and it was partly my fault, but I wanted to give him the credit he deserves. Uh, once Reagan laid out the 35 percent, 2,000 plus no worse capital treatment, he immediately fit into that framework. He, there was a first wave that lasted several weeks in which he tried to kind of be the little boy with his thumb in the dike and 
Holland. And uh, there were a little, give up a little bit on this, a little bit of that. After a few weeks, my memory is that wasn't working. It, the bill was dissolving into the House bill very quickly on any revenue he neutral was getting, basis. He was getting, he was getting pillory, hammered. There was like Fred, Barnes, magazine. Fred Barnes did a piece in the New Republic called Senator, Senator Packwood. Packwood yeah. And so Packwood, being a very smart politician, uh, knew that he needed to try something different. And that was, the, that was the background of the two or three pitcher lunch. I can't quite remember. It was two people and three pitchers or three people and two pitchers? I think it was two pitchers. They so don't I'm remember so either, but I, I would. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, second, but Packwood, uh, once he fit into that framework, it didn't work in the incremental way. Then he took the all at once leap into a 27% top rate and let's reason back from there. He did a phenomenal job. Bradley was helpful because he was on the finance committee. Moynihan was very helpful. He did a phenomenal job of, of bringing everything together. He gave in to the pro-family people on the $2,000 personal exemption. I'll never forget bringing Paul Weirich and a bunch of pro-lifers into Packwood's office. It was <laughs> one of the oddest couple. <laughs> but uh, I think Packwood professionally, just as a professional politician, not an ideologue, he really deserves enormous credit for having such a good bill come out of the Senate. Okay. Thank you so much. What a what a what a fascinating day. I you know I think I think it's everything that we hoped it would be, right? I think it's great oral history, and it's. Yes, absolutely. You will all be you will all be interviewed at at length individually, but uh, but this was a grand performance uh, by by everybody. So I'm grateful, and I know that the Kemp Foundation is grateful. Jimmy, you wanted to say some final words. Well, I'm James Kemp, president of the Jack Kemp Foundation, uh, and I'm the youngest of Jack and Joanne's four children. When each of us was growing up and we'd leave the house, uh, Dad had uh, much counsel for us, but the one phrase that sticks out in all of our minds is when he would say, be a leader. Um, the Jack Kemp Foundation's mission is to develop, engage, and recognize exceptional leaders. Um, today's event has been about recognition of an exceptional leader, Jack Kemp, who recognized that it was not his efforts alone um, that furthered what he called the cause, um, but that it was uh, a team of individuals. The foundation uh, exists to capture dad's legacy of leadership and help develop and engage uh, future leaders and current leaders uh, while recognizing the ones who are leading this country into the future. Um, and to no one's surprise, we will do it with an optimistic belief uh, that this country founded on incredible American principles and universal human principles um, has potential that goes far beyond uh, what many of us th can think of in the midst of the details of uh, what often is ugly legislation and, and the ways that it gets put together. Uh, today's example um, and lessons will be learned uh, and we're incredibly grateful uh, for this opportunity. Um, real quickly on the programs that we have with the foundation, uh, today's effort is a part of the Kemp Legacy Project um, where we have the Kemp collection, over 400 boxes of uh, my, my dad's papers at the Library of Congress where they're archived and we're in the process of uh, getting those digitized now that the library has finished their archiving and we'll make a portion of uh, the Kemp collection available online. Um, the Kemp oral history uh, is another component of the Kemp Legacy Project and that's uh, what we're doing here today. We've had uh, a, another symposium like this one already in Buffalo uh, on Jack Kemp, the Buffalo Bill, and Jack Kemp, the Buffalo politician, uh, Buffalo congressman. Um, and we will have subsequent symposiums as a part of the oral history. Um, and finally, we have, uh, oh, the Kemp chair, the 
our, our most important recent announcement. Mort, I don't know how I could, could have forgotten it. Um, we have the Kemp Chair for Political Economy, uh, which provides for a senior scholar to be uh, residing at the Library of Congress doing scholarly w research uh, and publication on what Kemp understood to be the American idea. Uh, and we're very proud that this week Dr. James Billington, the librarian, the librarian of Congress, announced that Mort Kondracki is the uh, first Kemp chair. Uh, Mort, thank you for your leadership of uh, this Kemp oral history, uh, and we're looking forward to you taking the Kemp chair. When we set up the Kemp Foundation, though, we knew that it had to be more than just about the past. Dad was not about the past, he was about the future. Um, and today, he would have enjoyed this. None of you would, would have been able to talk nearly as much as you were, um, because he would have corrected you on, uh, <laughs> on the way it really happened. Um, but when we recognized at the foundation that we couldn't really build something that was only focused on the past, uh, we took our lead um, from Dad, who when he and I worked together at Kemp Partners, he had a Buffalo Bill football player in his off season come be an intern with us. Uh, he happened to be a six foot seven, 330 pound offensive lineman, and anytime Dad would walk out of the office to meetings, uh, when Brad Butler, a University of Virginia graduate, uh, was interning with us, he'd say, Brad, come on, let's go. Um, and out Jack Kemp would walk with a six foot seven, 330 pound offensive tackle um, and take him to meetings. We set up the Kemp Leadership Academy to build on what Dad did. The Kemp Leadership Academy is the resource in Washington, D.C. for current and former professional and Olympic athletes who are interested in public policy and potentially public service. Um, and so we've been working with our first uh, professional athlete, Brendan Evans, who's a 24-year-old tennis player, who happens to be, I believe, enroll, he's been accepted to, and I believe he's gonna enroll as it happens at the University of Virginia. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, our final program is called the Kemp Forum, which is a debate and discussion series providing uh, a platform for the civil competition of ideas. Um, we've heard a lot about Dad's civility and respect for people, um, and the Kemp Forum uh, is a way that we can uh, push forward the efforts to have a, the real competition of ideas. Um, so that's where we engage exceptional leaders. The Kemp Leadership Academy is where we uh, develop exceptional leaders. Um, and uh, I want to thank a few people. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Michelle Van Cleve, who uh, heads the Kemp Oral History Project for uh, the foundation. Um, and her former fellow staff member, Marcy Robinson, who really uh, got this idea started and introduced us to Alan Murray. Um, so Alan, thank you for your uh, guidance to Marcy and to Michelle and to us. And that brings us to the Miller Center. Uh, Governor Blouse, thank you for your incredible support and kindness to uh, all of the Kemps as we've come down and uh, you've put the resources at the Miller Center at our uh, availability. Um, and Russell, thank you for your incredible guidance and wisdom uh, in teaching uh, some who are neophytes in oral history uh, about how to, how to do it. Mort, I've thanked you. I'd like to thank Brian Williams, who uh, is our oral historian guiding this project behind the scenes. Um, and panelists, you all have uh, done me a great service uh, by helping fill in the pieces of what was happening um, while I was in my elementary and teenage years and heard, uh, I, I always got criticized anytime I said, Dad, what, what are you talking about taxes? What, what is this talk about taxes? Jimmy, it's not taxes. We're not cutting taxes. We're cutting tax rates. Get it straight. Um, so uh, his, uh, his encouragement certainly always carried over into the, into the house. Um, you know, th this is very special for all of us, and on behalf of my mom and my siblings, uh, I do want to thank you all. Uh, the Kemp Network is an incredible one. It's not because of Dad. He was wonderful. We loved him. Sometimes we didn't love him. Um, but he tapped into something that we think is at the core of this great nation, uh, a cause that uh, 
leads people to do things that aren't only in their self-interest, but are in the interest of their families uh, and future generations. And we thank you all for your work and participating in this project. Thanks for coming and have a safe drive back to wherever you're going.